Ready. All right, how's everybody doing? What's up, doing real good, closer? man? What's going on? Just another day in paradise, my friend. Trying to, trying to stay alive. Don't wanna, don't wanna get too crazy. Been uh, sheltered in place for, it's been over a month now, and um, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting time. And, you know, it's a, uh, it's a unique time. It's a unique market. With everything that's happening with COVID nineteen, things are definitely changing. And thought it'd be really great to have you, both of you guys on as uh, being two very seasoned professionals when it comes to distressed property. Um, first, I'll, I'll introduce Ray. Ray Ward is a friend of mine I've known for like two decades. Uh, always has, has been very professional and very successful in, in, uh, in lending and was at one time a, an REO asset manager um, back mm -hmm. in like the late 2000s, right? Yeah, and, uh, and then uh, so we're gonna get into that, get into everything that you you know you're aware of, and in, in terms of the market and REO property, and and then of course uh, Tim Ray, my good buddy Tim Ray out of Kansas City, um, one of the top REO brokers when the market was uh, was down back in the late 2000s. Uh, Tim had taken advantage of a lot of opportunities, helped a lot of people. Um, and was one of the top REO brokers. So, you know, here we are, 2020, and um, you know, things are things are very interesting right now with with the way the market's going with COVID-19, and um, you know, like a lot of people are wondering, is are we headed into a bust? Like, is this is this market gonna lead us down uh, down a path that uh, maybe we've we've all experienced once before, and that was 2008. And the crash that occurred there. So, um, why don't we start with Ray? What do you What do you see out there, Ray? What do you What do you think, man? What do you think's happening? Well, there, there's a lot happening. There's a lot happening. We're seeing uh, We're seeing some similarities with the distress market that we were in back in 2008, 2009, uh, but it's also very different as well. A um, couple of things, you know, if you look at it from uh, apples to apples, you're going to compare. There's there's not much that is similar, but yet we are in a different type of distressed scenario right now. Right now we're in more of a, of a health crisis, whereas in 2008 2009 we were in a financial crisis. So the you, you're not going to see similarities with that because financial crisis we kind of saw that coming. coming. Uh, early in 2003, 2004, we saw all these different types of loans, these NEGAM loans, these stated income. I mean, you breathe, you can fog up a mirror, you can, you know, get a loan back then. Uh, it's not like that now. And right now, it's a it was a very stable market until this health crisis happened. So that kind of differentiates itself from that market that we were into this coming market that we're going into. Now it's more of a global thing. Uh, it's a health crisis that's out of our control. It really was not in our our hands. Whereas back in 2008, 2009, it kind of was in the hands of the banking systems that kind of really put all that stuff together where we got into that position that we were. So right now it's like, okay, do we know if there's going to be a heavy REO market? Do we know that it's going to be a light market? I don't think anybody can tell us. We don't know that much uh, in regards to that. But – are we headed into one? Absolutely. The indicators show it that we are going to be headed that route. To what extent? We don't know. Okay. So, so. you think you think we are heading into an REO market? Um, Tim, what do you think, man? Well, I think uh, I mean I agree with what Ray said. Like so, uh, to put a little bit of numbers behind it, you know, back in '08 and '09, uh, we had entirely different indicators than we do now, and one of the main indicators was. Um, just delinquency. And there were 3.4 million Americans that were delinquent on their loans and banks weren't offering forbearances as a solution. Whereas right now banks are offering forbearances and there's currently uh, three, four, 3.4 million Americans applying for forbearance now. So the same number of delinquencies in 08 is roughly the exact same number of forbearances right now. So I think we're ahead of the ball in that sense. Um, I think that we, we were able to get in front of it and banks have, have just instantly uh, offered a forbearance as a possible opportunity or option for people now 
how many of those for, forbearances are going to turn into delinquencies? I don't know. When you look at the unemployment rate, the, the highest level of unemployment we've ever seen uh, in, in the United States was 24.9% during the Great Depression. And we're somewhere between 20 and 24% right now, because I don't even know that numbers are out for last week. Um, and for this week, but it seems like, you know, there's four to six million Americans filing for unemployment every week. So we might actually have more unemployed people now than we did at the worst time that we've ever seen in our market. Um, so the interesting thing, though, is that already just because um, some states and some cities are uh, lifting the stay at home order or simply talking about it. We've already seen this week and in the last few days, lessening up of guidelines on lending. So if we got all these people without jobs, but the market is, 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 is literally as strong, it's, it's stronger than it was in 2019, which was the best year we've seen in real estate as a real estate agent. Um, so with, with, with that information, and that's very limited information, and I'm not an expert in any of this, I'm simply guessing, but I'm like, uh, it's still easy to get a loan. The market's really strong. Rates are, lo are low. And we have a, a quarter of our population is unemployed. And 3.4 million people are applying for forbearance. Some of those are going to turn into, into REO assets. Mm -hmm. they, ha they, they, they have to. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, uh, yes, 100%. We are. But to what level, what degree, I don't know. Yeah. Like Ray said, we, we can't. I think the difference though now, um, like we, Ray was mentioning, is in 2008, 2007, it was like a long buildup, right? There was a long buildup of people buying properties with 100% financing, bad credit, um, you know, not really any vested interest in the properties, right? So now, like, people have put a lot of money down and those measures measures have been put in place to prevent what happened in 2008 like you know lenders were more careful and things like that and um and it's just it was like going from like you said the top best economy ever to a complete halt but but at the same time there's the ppp loans that are being provided to businesses people are on a, there is a high unemployment but we're coming off of like one of the strongest economies ever so I feel like there's a chance that although people are out of work right now, that it can come roaring back again though too, right? Um, but with that said, I think you make a really great point that there are people that, you know, that are unemployed and that are on a, on a forbearance plan with their, with their lender that like there is gonna be a percentage of those people that won't be able to continue and may not get another job. So I guess, you know, I guess the indications uh, there are some indicators that show that we, you know, there are, there will be an uptick in REO property. Now the question is, um, what do we do about it as agents? Well, so I think, so one thing that's interesting is if you look at the, um, if you look at the amount, there were 3.1 million foreclosures. Um, and I don't know what, what year that span was, if it was, oh, seven to oh nine or 10 or like because of that time of our lives, there were 3.1, 3.1 million foreclosures, but there was also 12 months of inventory on the market. So we had a significant amount of inventory. And then we had all these foreclosures that added to our already significant amount of inventory. Whereas right now we're at 1.4%, at least in my market, I'm not sure where I'm sorry, at one, 1.4 months of inventory. Um, so, even though we might most likely see an increase in, in, in REO properties and foreclosures, it's only going to help, I believe, to fuel our economy as it relates to real estate agents, because we already have a lack of inventory. So if we have foreclosures coming on, it's just going to add to our inventory, which is going to keep our prices up. All speculation, of course, um, but I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's going to hurt our market or our economy the way the foreclosures did back in 0809. Do you agree, Ray? Yeah, I think the the we're gonna have a correction, but I believe also it's gonna be a short correction. Um, in my opinion, it's gonna be a short time frame. But the thing is, from what uh, Tim was talking about, is is exactly true about the inventory levels. Right now, sellers 
are kind of weary. They don't know what to do. They don't know if they should put their house on the market. They should wait until this coronavirus thing, you know, kind of gets eliminated or kind of gets a little more softer in, in, in the shelter in place and all that stuff. So there's a lot of uncertainty with that. But I know that once we start opening up the country slowly, slowly but surely, these sellers will have a little more direction. And I think that's going to cause a little more uh, influx of inventory coming on. But at the same time, are we going to go back to normal right away in a, in a snap of a finger? Absolutely not. I don't think so. I think there has been so much fear put into people because this is a health crisis. This isn't just a regular, you know, financial or, or economy or stuff like that. This is something that affects their health. So I think it's going to be a lot slower for people to come out of this and go back to living their normal lives and go back to doing the normal things that they were doing from prior to this. So you're going to have, uh, you're going to have that kind of gap in people still kind of not knowing exactly what's going to happen and how they're going to react to this whole thing. And that's why I think uh, one of the biggest REO opportunities that I think we'll be seeing is the commercial sector. A uh, commercial sector, I believe, is going to be a very big uh, REO, in, in my opinion. And it, just by looking at businesses, I mean, this corona, COVID-19 has killed small businesses. And But at the same time, it's also created opportunities for a lot of small businesses in what manner is they're realizing that, hey, maybe we don't need a 5,000 square foot office space no longer. Maybe we need a 1,000 square foot office space. Maybe we can have our people work remotely. It's been working great so far. You know, we have the technology. We have the video conference meetings. We have all these things available to us. Why not cut our rent almost to nothing at the same time, keep our employees and do what we were doing right now. So now it's kind of awakened a new wave of uh, way to work. So that's why I'm thinking because of that, you're going to see more office space available out there. You're going to see more commercial space available out there. And that's going to lead to more REOs in the commercial market. So that's something to also look out for. Tim, what do you think? I mean, is that something that... Man, I, I got to be honest with you. I didn't even think about that. My head wasn't even in that direction. Um, I would have to agree. I mean, uh, both places is where my offices are. Uh, there's people, one, one person's already gone out of business. There's a dry cleaner that uh, I'm told is going to go out of business. I didn't even think about it, Ray. I think that's genius. I also think it's accurate. Um, so thanks for bringing that up. And I would then have to agree with you. Yeah, I mean, I guess it just depends on how the how the property owners are positioned and what, what um, possible forbearances they're allowed to get or they're, they have available from, from their banks, I guess. And the thing is with the, with the whole CARES Act, there's really nothing in there about commercial um, business as far as commercial space. There's, everything is all about residential and mostly if you read the verbiage in there, it's all about owner occupants. Uh, they're talking about occupied properties they're not even talking about the non-owner occupants. And that's going to be another thing, these absentee owners. I mean, that's another thing that you're going to have to look at and as an opportunity for REO because the CARES Act isn't really set up for the non-owner occupants uh, that, as far as how it's written currently. And just recently, I mean, just as of yesterday, uh, the, it, it still wasn't clear as far as how everything's going to react to the forbearance until yesterday when all the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie and FHA and all them, they came out with more clear direction as far as how they're going to deal with forbearance after 12 months and that they're not going to take a lump sum payment anymore, uh, that they're going to, they've clarified that it's going to be more of a, either a modification or extend the term of the loans to the back end of the loan. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. People that are in forbearance right now, they can probably be in forbearance for about 12 months now. And what happens after 12 months? Now they've accrued all this interest that they've built upon because your interest is, you're still paying interest every month. It's accruing every, every single month, not just accruing on mortgages, it's compounding. So your interest is compounding every single month. When that's happening, you're losing equity at the same time while you're in forbearance. So for people that had marginal equity or just maybe bought their houses, you know, two, three years ago, now they're looking at it as 12 months down the road. They're already probably going to be negative. 
and they're thinking, okay, well, I haven't paid in 12 months. Why don't I just start over? I'm not going to pay for another year maybe until this foreclosure goes through. I'm set for a couple of years. You know what I'm saying? So this is kind of the mentality that also we're going to see people thinking in that manner. Wait, so you're saying after 12 months, after the forbearance is complete, the, the, the term is complete, you're saying people are going to, they're going to walk away or are you saying they're going to, they're going to stay or what exactly are you saying on that? Some people will, will end up staying, but there's some people that are probably going to be advised, hey, you're already at maxed out on your equity. You're not, you don't have any equity left because your price, price value has probably dropped a little bit and you've already ex, um, added all this compound interest that's added to your balance because that, that's going to just add to your balance. So you're losing equity there now as well. So if they were to try to sell, then they've got the realtor fees. They've got the you know, fees of closing costs and stuff that they have to pay. So that can leave them in a short sale situation. So they're thinking, okay, well, I'm already negative equity. Why am I going to keep a house that's I'm in, I'm in negative equity? I'm just going to, you know what, call it a day, maybe stick around for another year without making payments, save up some money, especially if they're still out of a job. I mean, these jobs aren't going to come back in, in, in a flip of, of a switch afterwards. You know, some of these restaurants, you know, people that are in restaurants and retails, you know, people that work in Nordstrom or, you know, all these, um, you know, retail shops, it's not going to open up that easily. And we don't know what the extent of that will be. So with, with so. REO, though, if, if most people are in a forbearance situation, they're getting what, like six to 12 months? So chances of any kind of REO inventory coming on the market due to coronavirus, like is like in the near future, within the next three months or something, is, it seems to me is, is kind of low. Would you guys agree? Well, I would say I would say that immediately, immediately, yes. And the other thing that we're going to experience that could be interpreted as an increase in REO as a result of coronavirus is simply going to be when the moratorium releases and everything that wasn't allowed to be foreclosed on and all this, all the cash for keys and all the evictions that couldn't be performed are all going to happen automatically. Not automatically. They're going to happen as soon as the moratorium releases. So when that releases, there's going to be a, an, a flood whatever that word means in, in different markets, but there's going to be, we haven't seen anything for almost a month and a half now. So the second it's lifted, we're going to get stuff in. That's not the result of coronavirus. That's the result of the banks and the government couldn't do anything right now. Uh -huh. But then, you know, I mean, generally you don't fall into default until you're, you're, you're three to, you know, three months late on a mortgage. And then the banks are very careful now on how quickly to foreclose. So it could be five, six months before we even start seeing foreclosures as a result of people that can't make their payment right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we won't realize it for, we won't realize it for a while. And I think we're still going to come into the spring and summer market booming. I mean, a healthy market is, is, is six months of inventory. We're at 1.4. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still, still a shortage. What, um, what can we be doing as agents to help clients? Cause look, we don't want to be predatory. We don't want to come across as being, you know, opportunistic in the situation with taking advantage of people and things like that. I mean, many of us, uh, you know, the, every agent that I know that I'm friends with truly cares about their clients. They care about their clients situation, you know, their families I and mean, we're helping families and helping people financially. Um, what do you guys think? What can we, what can agents be doing right now to help their clients if they're in a situation where, you know, times are tough and they're not sure what to do. I mean, what, what, um, what, if anything, can, can we be doing as agents? I mean, you know, we've talked about short sales in the past. We've talked about, um, you know, there's st strategic um, decisions that can be made with properties. I mean, what, what do you guys think we can be doing as, as agents to help clients that are in a tough situation? Me personally, I mean, I would think become an advocate. You really got to become an advocate with these homeowners. You got to be a resource for them. Uh, you sometimes have to be able to, you know, some of these people are maybe older or maybe their English isn't that great. And these are the times where you can step in as a realtor and become an advocate and, you know, pick up that phone with that homeowner and call their lender. And if it's a forbearance situation, talk to their lender with them and help them understand because you're the expert. 
And if you're the expert and you're with them during these challenging times and you're explaining to them exactly what's going on because of your expertise, now you're, you're looking like in front of them like a champ. They don't feel alone. So that's why, you know, in this time of, time of market that we're in, and I think in any market we're in, you always have to be an advocate with a homeowner and be resourceful. So provide value education. What do you think, Tim? Well, I agree. Um, I come, I would come at it from a different approach because, you know, 06, 07, 08, I did, I did massive amounts of short sales. And that was back at a time when um, agents weren't really doing them. It was, I mean, short sales have been around for since the time mortgages have been around, but we never saw the, the economy never reacted the way it did to uh, a situation as it did in 08 or 09. So people didn't know short sale was an option. And the only way we were able to uh, work with, with clients in that manner was to educate them. And what we found was so difficult is that when people are behind on their payment, they really dig in a hole most of the time. And then, you know, trying to extend information, be an advocate for them while we want to, we can't find them because they're not raising their hand saying that they're in trouble. Um, so it's, I think as an agent, it's be real aware and knowledgeable of what's available to, uh, to homeowners, whether it is a forbearance now, uh, you know, what happens when you don't make your payment? What happens to your credit score? What happens, um, the whole process leading from, you know, Hey, I paid my mortgage to, I don't pay my mortgage and what could potentially happen. So just like Ray said, be an advocate and how you, how you be an advocate is you educate yourself on what's available for homeowners right now, which it's simply these things. It's forbearances, it's short sales, it's a deed in lieu of foreclosures. If you are in that position where you can't make your payment. Um, so that's, that's what I would say. Here, here's an interesting that, uh, thing that came up uh, just today. And I don't, I didn't need, honestly, I didn't know how to answer that question. And there, there's a lot of unknown. And we're, you know, although we think we're experts in the field and the distressed market, I've been working in it for years and years. I still don't know the answers to all these questions because this is all new stuff, right? Uh, the question today was, okay, they are, they are in the middle of a short sale, but the servicer decided to send them to forbearance and without even the seller's permission. They just sent them to forbearance. They didn't do the short sale. So, I mean, how do you react to that? Tim, have you seen anything like that? Um, no, I haven't. See, that's the thing. It's, that was uh, that was new to me, where we have an active short sale on the market, we have it in escrow, and the servicer decided to send it to forbearance. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. what what happens there? I'm, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, um, just a thought. We talk a lot about providing content and uh, marketing and and being in, t in front of our clients, I think a really good thing to do right now is, is uh, like what you were saying, Tim, you asked the question, if you're in a position where you can't make your payment, here are the steps that you can take. And I would, I would just do a video on that, right? Like okay. I, would, I would do a video on that. I would, I would post it in, on Facebook. I would uh, even do, it, do a video, record it, use something like Bomb. bomb. Do, out, do an email blast to all of your past clients or maybe even um, we can find, we can find uh, data um, with sellers that could be in a potential distress situation and you can send out a message like that to them. And that's a great way, I think, to, to stay in front of them and just like Ray was saying, provide value and stay, uh, you know, be an advocate and help them and, and make sure that they understand that you're there to look after their best interests. Um, but I have a question for you guys, and, and it relates to uh, agents that want to position themselves to, to receive REOs or to be in a position where if the REO market does come back, how can they, how can they uh, get some of those listings? What's, you know, you guys are both, you Ray uh, being an, a former uh, HUD asset manager and you Tim being one of the top REO brokers in the country at one time. What do agents do? How do you get in front of these banks so that you can start uh, taking advantage of, of these opportunities and really help, you know, people in this situation? Well, uh, so 
we still do we still do a ton of REOs in Kansas City. We're still handling a lot um, to the tune of you know I think last year was around 300 that we sold in the Kansas City market. Um, well, the first thing to identify, I think is, and I, and I talk about this a lot. I get asked this question a lot. There is no authority on it, right? There's no book. There's no education on, Hey, how do you get into this business? I can tell you that it's all relationship. Um, and the first question would be, you know, to really understand what it means to, to be involved, uh, with foreclosures and with banks, because, you know, we have a $150,000 rehab going on right now in Kansas city and I have to pay for that. And then the bank pays me back, right? So we're doing, you know, you have to, you have to front a lot of money out uh, in many cases to cut grass and keep utilities on and hold these properties for months, sometimes a year, or if the bank decides to fix it up, you know, you got to pay for it. So there's a lot of expense. Uh, sometimes there's reduced commissions, you know, whatever your, I know we don't have a standard commission rate that we are, that we have, right? But if there is one in your market, REOs generally pay you less. And so you're getting paid less money um, to spend money to move property. So the first question would be, do you really want to get into it? Because it can look sexy and flashy. Um, and then the second thing is who has the properties and it's changing now because there's, you know, these, these national investment groups and hedge funds and real estate investment trusts that are holding properties and there's foreclosures uh, out there that are for sale that you would never even know are there. Um, so you, it's a relationship game. It's knowing who to talk to. And um, I could, I could continue speaking on it, but there's not one simple like, Hey, go do this. There's, you know, well, what are the, what are the banks? I mean, what do you do register with banks? I mean, I know it's relationship, but what's, where do you start? Like where would I even, um, I... man, there's, uh, there's platforms that people that many banks and asset management companies use one's called ResNet. It's a paid membership. Uh, if you pay the membership, it doesn't mean that you get properties sent to you because some of these asset companies are requiring specific levels of uh, certifications or something like that. Right. So uh, there's another one called pyramid. There's another one called equator. So there's these platforms that you plug yourself in, you upload your license in, you, um, put your E&O insurance in and that's one step. Uh, however, it's not, it's never a guarantee, right? I mean, Ray, you, you were on the other side of it, right? You know, um, mm -hmm. I, I can tell you one thing that's a myth uh, and it maybe used to be this way is BPOs, right? If you, if anyone's heard the word BPO, oh it's God. a, it's a, it's a broker's price opinion. It's a miniature appraisal. It's done by a real estate agent um, doing those for, there's a lot of BPO companies that will pay you to do them. Um, those do not get you in the door. They don't. It's, it's a good way to educate yourself on uh, how to run comps the way banks want. So I think everybody should get into, you know, BPOs just to educate yourself, but that's not going to get you in. Ray, what would you say, man? Someone comes up to you, you're an asset manager and you're like, Hey man, how do I get in? Well, that's that's a good question. It's it's a good question and it means of that there's going to be a lot of work, a lot of um, groundwork for you to do. It it's not easy and like Tim said, you know, it may be something that you don't you don't even know what you're getting into because I mean, on average there's like 87 different, you know, maybe even more, over 100 tasks for each property that you have to deal with when you're managing an asset. I mean, these tasks are all timelines. These tasks are, you know, if, there, if something is due on Friday, you want to get it in there on Wednesday. You don't want to wait till Friday because Friday will get you a mediocre score on your scorecard. So you got to be always on top of your game when it comes to dealing with our REOs because, first of all, the asset manager sometimes doesn't have patience. They have a book of business that they have to liquidate. And when you're taking your sweet time on everything that's coming in, they're going to drop you because there's 15, 20 other uh, agents out there knocking on their door that are hungry. So you really need to be set up in a proper way. Uh, but, you know, let, let's get back to how do you get this business, right? Yeah. I, you know, first things first, pound the pavement on, on, on your local market. I would go to the smaller banks now. The smaller banks, forget about 
large banks, Wells Fargo, B of A, Chase, Citi, all those. You can forget about those right now because those are the hardest ones that you can get into right now. Uh, especially now that we've been seeing more uh, BHCs, bank holding companies. There's a lot of bank holding companies that are holding these assets instead of the actual bank itself. So you may think that it's under you know Wells Fargo, but it's actually under a holding company for Wells Fargo. Why? Because they don't want to have the name Chase or Wells Fargo or whoever on that foreclosure. So they've set up, you know, holding companies that are going to be the ones that are going to be mostly in front as the asset management companies. Uh, so in order to find those out, you got to dig deep. Uh, but it starts with your local area. Go to your local community banks, your local credit unions. Anyone that does mortgages in your local market is a client. And sometimes I've, I, ha I was consulting for a credit union out in central um, uh, central U U.S. Uh, in the Midwest, and they were a a local little bank there, a credit union that did loans specifically for an industry. And I'm not going to get into detail of what it was and all that stuff, but they were a great resource, and I was helping agents. Uh, I was helping them source listing agents in the different states that they had assets in that they needed to liquidate. So you know. Those are great resources for you to go in, especially if you live in a large metropolitan city. Go in there and get that. And then just like Tim said, get involved in the platforms. Uh, you got Equator, you got ResNet, you got um, even one Realty Pilot, which is an older older system, but they're also one that you can uh, get in with as well. Uh, well uh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I, well, I, 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 thought you were, I thought you were taking a break for a second. Um, exactly what I did was I, I went to Dallas. There's a, a, a group, uh, a meeting group, a conference called Five Star. Uh, mm -hmm. They actually had to can cancel an event here, I think this month, which many people did, but it's usually in September. It's around, usually around September 11th and there's usually yep. a, a nice memorial they do for um, you know, the military and for the people that were affected by September 11th. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just about the time that it is. It's called Five Star. And it's actually now, I think, probably the largest... Um, default servicing conference and that's where i went many years ago and i actually ran into a group of people that uh, were sitting around a fire outside uh, and uh the conversation they were having was one that was not being had inside the conference and so i just got to know these guys and now i'm a member of a group called the ds pros which is default servicing pros and it's many people that many of us know jesse zagorski mike bjorkman uh long Dome, lots of these people and it's just uh professionals from around the country that joined this networking group that now collectively kind of know a lot of people. So the five star conference is a great place to go. Um, if you do go there, don't stand around network with people. Um, there's also NRBA, which is national NRBA national real estate broker Bro brokers association. association. Uh, you know, you can join that. It's going to cost you a little bit of money, just like any group would, but it's a networking group. So now that's a great group, by the way. Well, and, then, and, then, and, then what, and then what Ray said was like, you know, going to the banks, but also with the commercial, with the potential influx of, of commercial default that we might see just as a result of the businesses impacted by Corona, a lot of those mortgages are held by local community banks. Um, mm -hmm. and, and just making yourself known in, in those, you know, get to know the people in your, in your area there. Great stuff. Great stuff, guys. Um, what about if somebody does get into REO? Can it, like I remember when I, in 2008, 2007, REO agents had a ton of listings. Um, they had big teams. What are your thoughts on, on that? Can an individual agent be successful as an REO? You know, if they want to get an REO, do they need like a big team? What's, you know, what do they, what does a person have to do to prepare and what, what should they expect if, they, if they're going to be successful? Uh, with REO? Well, I can take that. And then I'm sure Ray's got uh, another side of the coin perspective as well from, you know, where he sat. Um, what you have to do is provide good service. And Ray alluded to earlier that, you know, you get graded on things and you have tasks and scorecards. And um, if you don't do things on time and you don't do them properly, you get fired. So it's not a function of a team or not a team. 
It's a function of what systems do you need in place to, to run that operation the way you need. No one ever woke up and just uh, instantly had a massive amount of REO. So it's not like you're gonna have a problem called, holy cow, I have a hundred properties that I have to deal with. You're gonna get one, you know, and then you might get two, and then you might pick up another client. So can an individual do it? Yes. Um, REO is one, one disposition that you can systemize. And I believe that people run systems and systems run business. So REO can be a volume game. I mean, to move 300 properties a year uh, in Kansas City, that's just REO. That doesn't even include traditional. We have very solid, very specific systems in place, um, which is called a team. So we do need a team to do it. Got it. All right. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, it, it does start as an individual. I mean, I remember in the days before I was a HUD asset manager, I was working as an asset manager for a uh, scratch and dent um, type of um, loan uh, portfolio company that all we bought were scratch and dent loans. And typically those were loans in default. And um, I remember this one agent that I was working with out in uh, Florida that was just, he was a one man show. And I'll tell you that per, that guy was a firecracker mm. and I'll never forget him because he worked his, his butt off as a one person, uh, you know, agent, REO agent, but we didn't have many properties that we assigned to him. Maybe there was, you know, one or two that I assigned to him, but he got the job done. So is it possible? Absolutely. As an individual, it is possible. But like Tim said, once you start getting rolling with these, and you know, you're going to need to have somebody do your BPOs because every, uh, every asset is going to require a BPO. Every asset is going to require a drive-by of you know, occupancy checks. You know, if there's cash for keys involved, there's a lot of different aspects to an REO that sometimes you're going to be running yourself out of time to do all of those tasks and make them done in a quality manner. So eventually, yes, a team is definitely a necessity. Uh, in the beginning, when you're just starting off, no, you're going to be the one man show or one woman show. So Got it. it's possible. Okay. You guys are both now doing, I mean, Tim, obviously you're, you still got a massive REO business. I had no idea you're doing 300 REOs a year still in Kansas city. Uh, that's amazing, man. I mean, uh, you still, you're still one of the top guys in the country and I had no idea it was 300 a year. That's, that's a, that's a big amount of business, dude. Um, but if you guys, you know, you're, you're working as a, as an agent broker in Kansas city, if anybody has referrals out in that area, shoot them over to Ray, Ray, uh, Tim, I mean, uh, Tim Ray <laughs> and, uh, Tim will take care of them. And also in California, if you guys, uh, Ray, Ray Warda is now in the lending business, got a mortgage company. So if anyone's got any referrals, once it, uh, once has clients that need to be taken care of for financing needs, uh, send them over to Ray at loan experts in, uh, in California. But I want to I want to ask you guys one last thing before we wrap up, um, and that's just prediction. You know, we don't have a we don't have a crystal ball. You guys both uh, obviously, you know, we, we you've both been in this business a long time. I, I've been doing this since 2002. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball, but we've got a lot of experience and we've seen things over the years um, with what's happening with COVID right now in the current market. What do you guys? How do you see the end of 2020? And how do you see the market beyond 2020? Who wants to take that? Oh, I can, I can start. I mean, uh, one thing that I see in 2020 that is different than a few years before is the election year. We're in the midst of an election that, honestly, we don't even know what's happening so far. You know, there's no more debates. There's no, you know, we ha we don't know if there's actually going to be a nomination in July or whatever the case may be on the Democratic side, uh, Republican side. You know, we know who that is, but we don't know how things are going to turn. I mean, we, I've been even hearing that there may be there there may be delaying uh, an election this year. So who knows? I mean, that right there in a normal market election year is always a cause of being stable type of everybody's at standstill. They want to figure out what exactly is going to happen. Even the markets are kind of not moving, you know, on election year. That's in a normal market. Right now, because of this uh, election year being in a volatile market that we're in, it's like, okay, what in the world is going to happen by the end of the year? 
do we really need, do we really know? I think it's really up in the air. This is the first time that I'm probably going to be speechless on knowing what's going to happen, the pr prediction at the end of the year, besides knowing that 2021 is probably going to be a challenging year for regular, you know, people. But as far as REOs, I do see an uptick. I do see a, a definite increase in short sales, definite increase in REOs, and you got to just uh, get ready for that opportunity to come. Well said, brother. I, um, <laughs> we have no idea, Kevin. Like it's like, it's the, it's the most interesting thing I've ever seen that in Kansas city. And I, I speak to Kansas city cause that's my market and I'm not, I don't claim to be an expert in other markets. Um, our transactions are still up and inventory is still down and agents that wake up and hustle are doing more deals right now. I literally within the last week, I've had 10 agents just in, in our company say that this is the best time, the best, the, I don't know what the words are, the best time they've had in their real estate as far as transactions go. Is it going to continue? Man, we don't know, but I can put some statistics to it that we've heard before. And I think this actually came from Sam Karamian, which probably came from National Association of Realtors. But if you're an agent out there, don't be afraid, fear not. Like, the, the producing agents, the ones that wake up, the ones that put their socks on, pick up the damn phone, those are the ones that are going to be successful. The worst year that we've ever seen in my lifetime as a real estate agent, I've been in the business 23 years, 2009 was the worst year that we've seen in real estate and there were still 4.3 million homes sold. The best year we've seen in real estate was 2019 and I think 2020 is going to be better than that by transaction count and by by increased sales price. We sold four, uh, 5.34. That's a Delta of 1 million. So the worst year to the best year, there was a hunt, there was a million homes less sold divided by 1.3 million real estate agents. That's like one transactions a year per person. My point is, even if the market tanks, even if we get a huge influx in REO, even if lending stops, we're still going to sell houses and the people that are going to sell them are the agents that want to hustle. Mm -hmm. that's that's a guarantee and that's couldn't have said it better I mean, I couldn't absolutely have it better. and uh you know and it's what's interesting is i i lived through the 2008 crash as well and um and interesting you mentioned 2009 being the worst year i happen to have my very best year in real estate up until that point in 2009 i've had better years since then but up until that point 2009 was my very best year ever and the reason i think i was I was able to do that is because I, I just avoided, I had like, I had a tunnel vision. I put, I put the blinders on and, and I just stayed in the weeds. I stayed in the weeds. I just continued to work every single day. And I realized and understood that it's a numbers game, right? It's a numbers game. Transactions are going to happen. I was on a call earlier today with Kent Clothier. He owns one of the largest real, real estate investment companies in the world that they, they, they have, they, they operate, they manage 6,100 properties. They sell hundreds of properties every single year. They flip them. And what he was saying is that he, is, he has this really, really great quote that I love. And, and the quote is, never underestimate the mediocrity of the competition. Most people don't put in the effort. Most people don't put in the work. Most people quit, right? And that's, that's, that's really an opportunity for those of us that want to put in the time, that are willing to take the steps and really do our jobs every day. And the hard part now is there's been a shift in how we do business because we're working from home because you know the shelter in place you can't go outside those kinds of things but we just have to be able to shift and at the end of the day it's a numbers game and those of us that understand that that it's a numbers game and don't allow emotion to get in between us and a transaction um are going to do well because we know transactions are going to take place because that the history shows right and deals are still happening to this day so where we fall short, I think oftentimes is we're putting in the work, we're making calls, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be doing in terms of connecting with people. And then things don't go our way. We don't get the results we want immediately. And then our emotion kicks in and we start feeling a certain way about what we're doing at that given time. And then we stop and, and that's where we fail. But if you see, find those people like yourself that are doing things at a very high level, you understand that it's number. It's just simply numbers. It's not, there's no emotion involved. And just, 
I know that those transactions are going to take place. I just have to execute and implement on a day-to-day basis and follow steps that other people have already taken. I don't have to reinvent the wheel and just take those steps on a day-to-day basis and have, keep those habits in place. And I know factually speaking, like the numbers don't lie. It's a fact. If I put in the work, the result will, will show. Right. So I think that's, you know, if we can just maintain that, I think, I don't think there's going to be any problem. So, uh, well said. Yeah. So with that, this has been a really good call, guys. I really appreciate you guys being on. Your your insight has been incredibly valuable to me, and I'm sure everybody else on uh, on this call today. If uh, if if anyone would like to reach out to Ray Warda or Tim Ray, um, we'll leave their contact information in the in the chat. Uh, once again, Ray's a lender in California with loan experts, uh, mortgage broker, and then Tim owns a real estate brokerage in, um, in Kansas city. So any referrals, you guys shoot them over and yeah. Well, I got, I got one, I got one, one last thing here, uh, Kevin, and thanks for having me on man. And Ray, it's always good to, you know, see you buddy, but someone, someone, uh, has, has asked a question what do you think about five-star Institute? I want to respond to that. Um, I don't have an opinion about five-star Institute. Um, the shakers and the players and the movers in the REO business are there. So if you have an opinion about, Five star, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be said. Like, if you want to be around people that are uh, moving massive amounts of property and build relationships with people that will impact and change your life forever, go to Five Star. But I don't get paid by Five Star. Like, I don't get. They don't. I don't endorse them. I just go there. So um, I just wanted to say that. Um, and I think that's. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Any last words? Right? Yeah, I just want to, I just do want to say thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to be on here and to um, definitely educate. And it's always my pleasure to do that. Um, I I do want to add one more thing that I learned from a quote that Michael Jordan uh, said, he said, I want to win at any cost. So and that's how you got to take your business right now. Win at any cost, don't let anything get, get in your way, whatever it is that is out there that's being spread as a fear or whatever, keep the noise out, stay focused on your business. You can't control what anybody else says out there. You control what you can do in your business and how you can provide for your family. So take that, stay focused and just keep plugging away folks. Right on. Thanks guys. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. See you guys. All right. Bye.